Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. The International Energy Agency has warned of more energy market turbulence unless higher levels of investment are made to both meet demand and decarbonize energy systems. Terence Screamer joins me to discuss the warning and what it means for South Africa. Hi Terence. Hi Chanel. The latest World Energy Report was released against the backdrop of what is something of a global energy crisis. Yes, it's a crisis. I mean, so South Africa uh, almost looks at this and smiles because we've been in one since the, uh, for more than a decade. And we've had, you know, electricity load shedding again. And uh, this load shedding doesn't seem to be getting any better. We had a very intense year in 2020. 2021 looks set to be worse. So we look at the world and we say, oh, what's your problem? <laughs> but actually, this is a serious crisis that's happening around the world. We've seen the, the lines outside uh, petrol stations in the UK, see the gas prices are surging around the world. There's a shortage of coal and the uh, price of export coal has really risen to record levels. China's actually uh, made it some policy interventions to allow their coal miners to carry on even when there's so usually would be safety stoppages to go beyond their normal quota of production to import like there's no tomorrow so long as it's not from Australia. So we can see there's a, a serious uh, crisis, there's shortage, there's price spikes all over the world. And uh, it's, it's really this is the backdrop for a world uh, energy outlook which was supposed to be really about uh, messages for ahead of the COP26 because we know the energy systems, both the electricity systems as well as the, the transport, the mobility systems, are key uh, carbon emitters at the moment. And they brought it out early so that they could uh, give these sort of big picture messages to the government leaders that are going to be meeting in Glasgow, Scotland in November, where they're going to be talking about how we are going to get onto a pathway of, uh, of temperature rises that don't go above 1.5 degrees about pre-industrial levels. We already have breached the 1.1 degree level, so we can see already that there's been uh, changes to our weather systems, much more intense storms, uh, many, many floods that we've seen this year, uh, heat domes, so we, uh, and you know, droughts uh, around the world. So there's some, there's some serious uh, impacts already from this breaching of the 1 degree, 1.1 degree level about pre-industrial age. There's no longer a debate around the science. The science is clear. These, these is, uh, this is caused by human uh, uh, emissions, not natural emissions. And that if we want to get onto a pathway, we need to accelerate uh, on the pathway towards 1.5 degrees. We need to accelerate the decarbonization. And uh, the easiest and quickest way to do that is definitely around the electricity system where we have a solution that, that is cost competitive in the form of solar PV and wind backed by flexible technologies. Some of these are still fossil related like gas, uh, but others more and more uh, we're seeing uh, flexible solutions coming in the form of battery storage and in the future green hydrogen. So that's the backdrop to this world uh, 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 energy outlook that was released this week uh, is one of crisis also one of message that we really aren't um, decarbonizing fast enough. The IEA has dismissed arguments that climate policy and renewables are to blame. Yes, the, that has been, I think, the message. Uh, there has been this lower wind production out of parts of Europe um, during this period. So uh, immediately it was about the, the tension turned to wind, uh, to variable renewable energy, the difficulty of managing the variability associated with these two new technologies, these giant technologies that are emerging, solar and wind, and how we haven't re they aren't being complemented properly, we're going too fast. And uh, uh, the energy agency, the International Energy Agency has dismissed this uh, as a sort of a gross mischaracterization of what's happening. Yes, it does require a whole different way of managing the system. There is more decentralization, uh, but, and there, there is this variability that has to be dealt with. But their argument was that there's just this misalignment between uh, investment uh, and also di and sort of curtailing of investment uh, at the moment. So we're seeing that there isn't enough clean energy investment going in. At the same time, we're seeing a massive pullback in the fossil, fossil fuel investment. So while the one is not on the, the say, 1.5 degree pathway in terms of clean energy, we're not investing enough, uh, the other 
is on that pathway. So gas and oil is really uh, curtailed to those sort of levels. So we're seeing this gap emerge. And the, the answer really uh, in the IEA views is, is not to pull back from the clean energy transition, but rather to accelerate and intensify it. The IEA warns that the current investment trajectory will not be enough to ensure security of supply or net zero emissions. That's right. I mean, I think they use the usual typical scenarios in, in this report. Uh, the, the one is the stated energy policy scenario that countries are actually implementing or have announced that they are implementing. Then there's also the pledges that people have made ahead of COP26, South, like South Africa in terms of decarbonisation. And then there's a net zero scenario. Under all those scenarios, uh, there are risks and vulnerabilities. Under the STEPS scenario, which is the stated energy policy, there's no way we're going to stay below the, the 1.5 degree level. We're going to be still rising at the end of the century over the, over the 2 degree level. And you must remember some parts of the world, such as Southern Africa, are going to uh, heat up twice that rate. So if the world is doing 2 degrees, you can imagine what's going to happen in a region like, like Southern Africa. So th there's this whole mismatch uh, around investment uh, and needing to scale up, for instance, grid investment, much more uh, renewables, and then uh, the technologies that are going to support the hard to abate sectors. Now the IEA says if we want to get to the sort of, uh, ha keep the door open to 1.5 degrees, we need to be scaling up clean energy investment to around $4 trillion a year by uh, the end of this decade. And that would be a tripling from today's level. So you can see there's a massive gap. And that's really the key message ahead of COP, that countries need to align their investment, their energy investment, their policy environment to allow these investments to take place and to facilitate this transition uh, to a decarbonized energy system. Even under the, <coughs> the, the sort of pledges that have been made ahead of COP, and we know there'll be more that have been made, it's not going to be enough. We're going to breach the 1.5 degree uh, during the next decade, um, and we're going to be quite short. But even with that, there's massive amounts of wind, solar, uh, nascent investments in hydrogen that will start happening. It will start changing the energy system. So even with those uh, inadequate investments, we're going to see major changes to the energy system. And one of the other areas of investment that is un being under investment at the moment is in critical minerals that are needed to support this uh, rollout. Uh, we know that mining, this is a mining and metal, what's a metals and minerals intensive transition. We've had a fossil fuel intensive energy system. It's going to transition to a metals and minerals intensive uh, energy system. And these minerals are going to have to be mined and recycled at scale. And we know we're near that. So that's another risk that has been uh, highlighted in this report. What could the current crisis mean for South Africa? Well, I think for one, we could misread <coughs> what the report is saying and saying, look, it's too hard, it's too turbulent, we must just stick with the pathways that we're on, cling to coal, uh, get ready f to scale up uh, uh, natural gas imports either through L or LNG initially, potentially from um, northern Mozambique, um, and, you know, try and get our gas, uh, domestic gas going. That could be the message that we take away, and I think that is the message that some in government have already taken away that we need to scale up coal. Uh, but I think the real message is that South Africa uh, is at, at risk if we don't take the signals that the world is sending us, that uh, the world is serious about decarbonisation. We're not doing, at the p doing it at the pace and scale that is needed, both for decarbonisation and energy security. And we need to actually build our economic future around this energy transition. The good news is that we've actually done quite a lot of work, particularly in the, the electricity sector, to visualise this transition. We know the integrated resource plan is, is entirely inadequate and out of date, but even that signals the transition that we have to go. It signals clearly that the cheapest uh, form of electricity is based on solar, wind and flexible generation technologies and no longer coal. Coal is expensive even when you don't add in carbon taxes, new coal I'm talking about, expense, even when you don't add in uh, carbon taxes or the cost of abating emissions from coal, it is now much more expensive than the, the uh, solar wind flexible generation solution. So that's really the message that we should be taking, that we need to really accelerate. We're really behind even 
the inadequate integrated resource uh, plan of 2019. We're already behind on implementation there. We have to uh, uh, accelerate the implementation. And we need to create the policy environment because we know ESCOM is mostly broke, but it will get, it seems, some concessional finance to do some of the transition investment that is needed. But we need the private sector to really complement this and the, the environment has to be right. We've seen some good reforms uh, recently that are important, but it's not enough because the whole framework is not really in place for a, uh, a system of high levels of private investment. We, ha we don't have a tariff structure that's in place that's, uh, that's really um, speaks to the transition. We don't have an industry uh, structure in place that speaks to the transition. We still have a, a, a sort of a vertically integrated, centralized type structure that is not really um, fit for purpose. So we need to make these uh, policy changes and we need to start implementing these at, at a pace and scale. And then on the mobility end, there's a huge opportunity to electrify mobility and to start integrating green hydrogen or fuel cell uh, um, uh, technology in the mobility space. But again, we need to make those pilot investments. We need to create the policy framework that is supportive um, because we know we've now made a choice around clean fuels which our domestic refineries cannot meet. So we, we've got a, a deadline ticking on clean fuels. None of the refineries are um, moving to make uh, the clean fuels investments that are needed. If they did, they'll have a, a lower capacity. So we're going to be reliant on imports. So the best way to, from a balance of payments perspective, to de-risk that is to scale up your domestic source of uh, um, fuels that can go into mobility. And the best domestic sources will be through solar and wind, either directly through electric vehicles, but where those are not uh, appropriate because we know for long haul, heavy freight, marine freight, aviation fuels, um, those are not going to be easily electrified. We're going to have to really become a green hydrogen champion and create those uh, derivatives that are needed in those different spaces from that green hydrogen. So I think the, the, the worst message that we could take is that, oh, it's too hard. Uh, we can see what's happening in the rest of the world. Let's retreat back into our coal shell. I think the, uh, the real message that we take is that we actually have to accelerate and scale up and do that at uh, a massive scale. Thank you. That's the second tech show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis. Also, don't forget to listen to the audio version of our engineering news daily email newsletter.